the crisis parity needle, building meaningful partnerships between behavioral health crisis providers and payers. My name is Travis Atkinson, and I'm with TBD Solutions, and it is a pleasure uh, having you join us today uh, as a part of this webinar. A few housekeeping items uh, to get started. Uh, if you're having any problems with hearing the webinar, um, use the dial-in number that was provided with your meeting invite. Uh, if you need a local number, uh, that number can also uh, be generated from the link uh, in the Skype meeting invitation that we send out. Also, a recording of this webinar will be made available and posted to our YouTube page uh, within the next two weeks. Uh, if you have colleagues that were unable to attend and would like uh, them to be involved. Uh, also, we will have a Q&A session at the end of our webinar uh, once our presenters have finished. Uh, so feel free to hold your questions till then. Um, if they're burning questions and you just don't want to lose them um, uh, from your mind, feel free to type them in the conversation box if you're using our Skype for Business platform. Um, otherwise, just write those down and we will make, uh, uh, make time available for those comments or those questions. Uh, and we will also give you instructions uh, on uh, turning the mute off of your uh, phones to be able to ask uh, those questions. TBD Solutions is proud to sponsor today's webinar. Uh, we are a consulting and research group uh, focusing on uh, healthcare services. Uh, we have provided assistance in crisis program development uh, and metrics portfolio developments. We also offer a middle management training and do work in the areas of interactive data visualization, uh, quality and process improvement, and research and analysis. Uh, we have also been leading the crisis best practices work group, uh, which we will talk about in a little bit. Uh, to learn more about the work that we do, go to tbdsolutions.com. You can also visit us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. So the objectives for today's webinar, uh, we are hoping to, with, with many providers on the phone today, uh, crisis service providers, we're looking to understand how private health plans approach population health, reduce costs, and meet the needs of their insured individuals and how new services are considered for addition to the current service array. We also hope to learn about successful partnerships between commercial health plans and crisis service providers that help meet the triple aim goals while avoiding unnecessary high cost services and maintaining high, qu high quality programs. Lastly, we want to understand the important steps to consider when pursuing a partnership with a commercial health plan. So a little bit of, about the history of crisis stabilization services. So if we go back to 1963 when President John F. Kennedy signed the Community Mental Health Law uh, into, uh, excuse me, the Community Mental Health Act into law, uh, crisis residential and crisis stabilization services have begun to evolve as largely a Medicaid-funded um, uh, Medicaid funded programs that are intended to serve individuals who are experiencing a psychiatric crisis. So these programs often can serve as a, a diversion from psychiatric hospitalization as well as a step down. Uh, so someone might go to a psychiatric hospital for a few days and then spend time uh, at a crisis stabilization unit, uh, which is more of a, a, a less intensive environment. Uh, they can also be used as a diversion from uh, an emergency room or in some states a diversion from jail for individuals who perhaps have committed a crime and have a mental illness. The benefits of these services are that they are uh, cost effective. Uh, they usually cost about half of uh, the rate of a psychiatric hospitalization or, or of, of the, the, the stay in, in a psychiatric hospital. Uh, oftentimes they are more person-centered. So uh, most uh, crisis residential programs or crisis stabilization programs embrace the recovery model, uh, believing that uh, people are in different uh, continuums or parts of the recovery, that it's a process, uh, and that, uh, that, that progress should be celebrated, um, that sometimes um, uh, 
symptoms uh, are, an, are, are a natural part of the recovery process uh, compared to a more medical model approach of uh, addressing a deficit and, um, and, and, and treating it. And uh, there's also evidence of better outcomes in crisis stabilization services. So there's over 40 years of research going back uh, to the 70s with, with crisis stabilization programs that they, uh, that they work, that they do all of these things in the, in the interest of keeping costs down, keeping satisfaction high, and keeping outcomes high. So when we think about crisis stabilization services, uh, we are talking about services that are short term, they're community based, they're happening in a home or a home like setting, and we're talking about multi day lengths of stay. So uh, how this program differs from perhaps a, a 23 hour type program or from a, uh, a peer run program is that uh, the, the service often includes nurses, uh, direct care providers, a clinician, uh, a manager, uh, and uh, nursing staff and psychiatry staff uh, a few days per week. Uh, the nursing staff generally somewhere between eight hours a day and 24 hours a day. Most of these homes in the country range in size from six beds to 16 beds, and they take on a lot of different names as we've learned uh, from our uh, crisis work group that we developed. Um, the names include crisis residential unit, crisis stabilization unit, facility-based crisis, crisis respite, and there are a number of other names. So to tell you a little bit about our crisis best practices work group, in November of 2016, we, uh, with providers in uh, the state of Michigan, TBD Solution began reaching out to uh, crisis stabilization providers in other parts of the country with the intent to develop a best practices toolkit for crisis residential and crisis stabilization services. We estimate that there are approximately 325 crisis programs like this across the country. Uh, we have been pleased to engage over 110 of those programs from 37 states and three countries in our work group. Uh, so we've had a chance to reach out and talk to programs from Canada, uh, to talk to some programs from England, and also uh, from someone who is working to develop a similar program in Costa Rica. Um, so our purpose is to develop this best practices toolkit for crisis residential services that, it, that is informed by providers across the country. So instead of taking an approach of asking a few experts to weigh in on their experiences in the formation of a toolkit, we want this very much to be more of a crowdsourcing model where we are engaging providers from all across the country, understanding the nuances and the differences in those services, uh, but ultimately being able to create a platform where those providers can communicate with each other and uh, they can advocate for the service, either for its uh, continuity or for its growth and expansion. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the work that we're doing, go to crisisresidentialnetwork.com. So in our best practices work group, we host a monthly phone call. And prior to that phone call, we send out a survey to our provider network to say, okay, tell us about what you're doing uh, in your program related to staffing. So how, how many staff do you have? What, what are some unique parts of your staffing? Do you have interns at your program if there's a, a college uh, that, that can supply interns? Uh, tell us about the metrics in your program. How do you measure success and how do your funders measure success? Um, what is your intake process like? Uh, recently we talked about, uh, this was actually in, in our most recent uh, conference call, we spoke about funding. How are your programs funded and uh, you know wh what kind of types of challenges come along with trying to maintain your funding streams? Um, we'll also be talking about the safety net in this month's meeting and how crisis programs fit into the community safety net. What are they asked to do? What is the expected uh, function? And then what happens when they're asked to do more than that? Um, and all of these topic areas will be covered in uh, the best practices toolkit that we create. 
So here's an example from our, uh, our, our uh, conference call this past month on funding. So this graph uh, here kind of gives an example of the percentage of programs that are funded by each of these various areas. So as you can see, 70% of the, the programs that responded to our survey this past month uh, receive Medicaid funding. So that can come in a fee-for-service model where programs only get paid if their beds are full, or it can come in a um, kind of more of a, a block funding model where a program is paid for operations uh, of, their, uh, of their services regardless of how many people are in those beds. Now, as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, if you don't provide one of those services, if, you, if you're not currently a crisis residential or crisis stabilization provider, uh, you can understand how the tension can change or how the priorities can change based on what type of model you are involved in. And we find that with providers across the country, um, some of them feel like it's a it's a month to month existence of survival. Um, others that don't have some of those stressors related to funding um, are able to focus on uh, client care, um, employee satisfaction and employee experience um, and, and just providing a good a good treatment system. Not that the other ones don't, um, but that that tension or that stress of having to worry about keeping your beds full uh, can certainly contribute to an already uh, stressful or intense environment. So as we started to bring up funding uh, over the past few months, there's been a few instances where crisis programs have talked about uh, their, um, their ways that they've diversified their funding streams. And there are, are just a pocket of providers um, across the country that uh, are starting to engage in um, arrangements or contracts with commercial health plans. Um, in our survey last month, we noticed that only 32% of our crisis providers contract with private health insurance plans. Um, we also learned that 71% of the, of the providers that are in uh, a fee-for-service arrangement or in a contracted arrangement um, do not have a cost-settling arrangement with their funder. That means if they had set a budget and they were asked to do a lot more, perhaps as part of the safety net, or if they weren't able to get the referrals that they needed to keep their um, their beds full, um, that it's kind of their problem and they're not uh, given an opportunity to recoup those costs. So naturally, uh, crisis stabilization providers are interested in finding ways to diversify their funding streams, to maintain that sustainability, to, to, to have less of a focus on uh, this survival approach of how are we going to make it through the next quarter or how are we going to keep um, our doors open. Uh, because really, if you think about it, um, unlike a hotel or unlike um, uh, you know so, some other type of, of service arrangement, the goal of a person being in a crisis residential bed is so that they don't have to be in a crisis residential bed anymore, right? And so the individuals that are receiving care usually know that they want to get back to the life that they had before they uh, before they came into crisis. Uh, the providers know that they they want to help them in their recovery, and they recognize that this isn't a long term solution. Um, and oftentimes the funders recognize that that even though the cost is only half of um, of what it would be to go to a psychiatric hospital, that uh, funders are still very mindful of the amount of money that they spend in emergency psychiatric care. And so everyone is incentivized to keep the lengths of stay short. And so that can be helpful assuming you're hitting that sweet spot of, of making sure that they have the right amount of care, that they don't need to come back uh, within a certain period of time, um, but that you can provide that really relevant treatment and get them where they need to go. But if you're really good at that, if you're really good at your job as a crisis provider, um, then you might keep your length of stay short. And if your funding is dependent on length of stay and your length of stay is short, um, then you might run into some challenges. You might be both a successful provider and struggling to, uh, to, get, to get those needs met, to get where you need to go. So that helped us to bring uh, up this idea of what if we started to look at what it's like from the funder perspective. And so we are fortunate to have two commercial health plans joining us today. And I'm going to introduce uh, the speakers from the first, uh, the, the first health plan. 
Rick Johnson received his Bachelor of Arts degree in philosophy and religion from Spring Arbor University in 1980. In 1986, he received his RN licensure from Bon Secours Memorial School of Nursing. In 1994, he received his Master of Science degree in healthcare administration from the Medical College of Virginia at VCU. He has uh, worked for Bon Secours Richmond Memorial Hospital, HCA, and Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield of Virginia, where he currently serves as Director of Behavioral Health Services. Anne Rondazzo has enjoyed the last 25 years at Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Her business experiences at Anthem include working in finance and provider engagement and contracting. She currently serves as Program Manager for Behavioral Health Services and is passionate about her family, traveling, and her job in that order. <laughs> and lastly, Mike Triplett is an undergraduate student at West Virginia University. He is pursuing a Bachelor of Business Administration degree in International Business Management. He is currently an intern for Anthem BCBS working in the Behavioral Health Leadership Team. So I would like to welcome all three of you to the call today. And if you could hit star six to unmute yourself, uh, we look forward to hearing your thoughts uh, on these partnerships. Thank you, Travis. This is Rick. Can you hear me? Yes, Rick. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, Travis. This is Mike. Uh, I'd I'm like here. Okay, we've got uh, Rick and Mike, and uh, we're just trying to find Ann right now. But um, oh. Rick, you... oh, hi, everybody. Yes, okay. I'm sorry. I'm here. This is Ann Randazzo with Anthem. Great. Well, welcome Thanks to all three of you. I will I will push the floor over uh, and and give the reins to 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 each of you. Thanks so much for being here with us. Thank you, Travis, for the invitation. This is very fortuitous for Anthem, given where we are with crisis stabilization. I want to thank all of you who are taking your time to listen to us today. I hope we can be helpful and useful to you and provide some good information. And as Travis said, please write down your questions. We'd like to answer them at the end. If we don't get to them all, we'll have contact information at the end of the deck. Please email your questions to us. Um, let's go on ahead to the next slide, Travis. So I'm going to kind of walk you all through the path. The big question it seems to me here today, or the overarching theme, is how do you become involved with commercial payers, and how do commercial payers become involved with crisis stabilization programs? So we're going to walk you through the path that we walked at Anthem to become involved with these services, tell you about our success with that, and uh, then tell you where we're heading in the future. Back in the mid-summer of 2015, we received a call from leadership at the Region 10 of CSB. CSBs are what we call CMHCs in Virginia. I know that's true in some other states. And they had found that they were seeing some of our commercial members in their residential crisis stabilization program. Um, because they were not participating in our network, they weren't getting paid for those members. All they were able to do was charge them according to the sliding scale that they used. So, they were interested in finding out, since they were seeing our members anyway in increasing numbers, would it be possible for them to join our network? So they reached out to us and asked that question. And our, our initial answer was, you know, we would certainly like that, but we don't even know or understand what crisis stabilization services are. We know there's something typically covered by Medicaid and something commercial, HMO and PPO plans for Anthem at least, have never covered. So we began an investigation. Um, to see if we could get this program in network and how difficult it would be. If you've never worked on the insurance side, you probably don't appreciate how difficult it can be to create a new benefit or create a new type of provider in your network. Those are huge administrative obstacles. So we were hoping we would face those, and indeed we did not. In trying to answer that question in a conversation with Region 10, we discovered that their crisis stabilization program was licensed as a residential care facility. Well, since the onset of mental health parity, we have had a residential facility network. So all, all that was needed was going to be to bring them in network as a residential uh, program. So the first, what we thought would be an obstacle, was very simple. And I, that's something I would encourage you to investigate as you begin to work with commercial payers, is ways that you can make it easiest for them and easiest for yourselves to fit into their existing network structures. So if you're residentially licensed, most commercial plans are going to have that type of network, and they can probably credential you right in. Um, let's go to the next slide. 
Thank you, uh, Travis. So we did have some concerns, and Travis asked us to address those in this in this, in this uh, presentation. What were our hesitations or our concerns? Um, and so I've, I've bulleted them out here. I'll speak to them briefly. Uh, we, well, our one concern was that this might simply be another level of care. Um, I've been in the business long enough to remember when there was PHP and there wasn't IOP. And as those services came into being, we were told, well, they will deflect inpatient utilization. Um, and they do to some extent. I'm trying to be fair here. But what has also happened is in many cases, they've just become another level of care. So you go inpatient to partial to IOP. So we had some concern that we would just create a new continuum that would be inpatient to crisis stage to partial to IOP. Uh, another concern that we had was, in Virginia at least, uh, the majority of CSB funding is local from their catchment area and their local board. A smaller portion comes from the state and an even smaller portion from federal funds. And there's very little statewide oversight. The primary oversight for our CSBs lies in their local board. But not all of our CSBs had crisis stabilization units. And for those that did, the difference in service quality and the extent of services vary dramatically. So it didn't seem to us to be a homogenous type product. And we, we were fearful that if the pilot worked with one, it might not work with others because they may have different levels of uh, quality and intensity of service. And our final question had to do with what our commercial members adopt this service. It's always a question when you create a new benefit or a new service, how will your members respond to that? And in particular, we wondered how our commercial members would respond to mixing in with a predominantly Medicaid population in what is publicly recognized as a Medicaid service venue, that is the community service board. So those were the questions that we had going in. Um, however, having found the route in bringing them into our residential network to make it happen, we proceeded. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Anne now to tell you how some more detail about how we actually got the program in network um, credentialed and, and signed up to a rate. Thanks so much, Rick. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Anne Randazzo, and I am program manager for behavioral health um, um, for Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield in Virginia. Um, um, Travis, would you mind um, forwarding the slide? Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so I'd love to share with you all a little bit of information about how I've been working with providers um, with getting them contracted um, with Anthem of Virginia. Um, Travis, do you mind um, also sharing the other Word document that I shared with you? Yes, I'm going to try wanna... some uh, uh, technology magic and see if this works. I'm hoping it's going to. <laughs> that would be great. Thanks so much. All right, so I um, prepared a document. Um, I've been sharing this with um, the Virginia Community Service Boards that we are um, actually recruiting for this um, um, agreement. And I wanted to share that document with you guys. It has information in there about how to be con or how to get contracted and credentialed with Anthem. It also includes some billing information. So, Travis, if you can't pull it up, um, I'm sure you can provide it at the end of our convert. At so, the end of the meeting. so Anne, I have I've uploaded the document into the Skype um, platform. Um, I, I believe there's a way that people can download it in there, but what I will okay. what I will also do if people aren't able to see it right now is I will uh, uh, send it to all of our meeting participants um, right at the end of this meeting. Okay, that's perfect. Um, yeah, I don't see it coming up right now, so maybe I'll just um, provide you guys with a little bit of information, um, you know, at a high level of what's in this document. So again, we provided um, a document that gives um, details about our um, eligibility criteria, um, which um, includes um, details about accreditation. Um, we do require accreditation um, for our providers to participate. Um, we also require that 
providers be licensed for residential crisis stabilization services. Um, we found um, by having conversations with the providers that several are, were not accredited. So in lieu of accreditation, we are allowing them to um, participate as long as they've had a CMS or state site survey. So that would be required um, along with a waiver from Provider Solutions um, giving them permission to participate. Um, the document that's going to be shared, oh, there we go. There it is. All right, so there are some details of um, the general criteria um, that's required for healthcare delivery organizations. Um, again, accreditation is listed, but um, you know we do have um, we are allowing providers to participate with the CMS or state site survey. Um, and of course, we do require a Medicare certification, a completed W-9 form. Um, liability insurance is also required. Um, if you could go ahead and um, forward to the next page, Travis. Um, here are some details. I disappeared. Well, I'll go ahead and talk through it, and um, hopefully it'll pop up in just a couple minutes. Um, I, I meant the next page of the um, the Word document. There we go. Is, is that up yet? Nope. Um, okay. We'll Sorry, Anna. Hold on just a second. We'll get that going. Okay. Um, so on anyway, on the second page, I'll just go ahead and tell you about it. There are billing requirements. We do require that providers bill on the UB04 document and they have they need to bill of um, type of bill 861 um, they bill with revenue code 1001 it's pretty simple um, billing format but those are our requirements and um, our, our reimbursement for crisis stabilization providers it's um, it pretty much mirrors what we pay our residential treatment centers um, so anyway, this document will be provided at the end of our meeting, but um, you can go ahead and, um, Travis, go back to the, the slides. And the next thing I wanted to talk about is our authorization process. Um, okay, so we do have an authorization process where the providers contact um, our utilization management area. Um, for this crisis stabilization um, pilot that we have going on right now, we are um, approving an automatic 15 days. Um, so, of course, um, the providers reach out to us. They provide us with basic clinical information such as diagnosis, symptoms, a list of medications and history, and we will automatically approve um, 15 days of services. Um, there is a requirement that the patients have a primary mental health diagnosis code. All right, so on to referrals. Um, the community service boards will be um, receiving referrals um, from hospitals in which they have standing relationships. Um, all of the CSBs work with their local, um, the hospitals in their local area, and um, again, they would communicate to those hospitals that they're able to provide crisis stabilization services. So that's how they receive their referrals. Um, the goals of this um, service, of course, are to avert hospitalizations or rehospitalization. Um, to stabilize individuals in a psychiatric crisis, and also to um, reduce readmissions. Um, so, and again, um, you know, we are seeing a significant cost of care um, reductions um, based on these crisis stabilization services. So, 
again, thanks to all of those providers that are participating and the ones that we're recruiting. Um, hopefully, we can get you guys in our network soon. Um, go ahead and um, forward to the next slide. All right, so now I'm going to turn it back over to Rick. Thank you, Anne. Um, so in one of his opening slides, Travis said that what we have found with crisis stabilization benefits is that they are cost-effective, person-centered, and better provide better outcomes. Um, I'm going to walk through what we found with our pilot, and I'm going to attest to that um, with all of the vociferousness I can muster, I think, and at this point, all of Anthem believes that crisis stabilization is one of the best kept secrets in behavioral health care. Um, the services you all are providing are amazing, that they lead to amazing outcomes, and uh, we, we just cannot wait to add this service to our, make it available to our membership in all of our 14 Anthem states. So let's talk first about average length of stay. Um, as Ann mentioned, we authorized 15 days up front without medical management or UM, um, and we just had to wait and see what the average length of stay would work out to be. Uh, it turns out for the year of our pilot, the average length of stay in the crisis stabilization unit was 7.2 days. Now, if we look at people with similar diagnoses, um, major psychotic illness and psychotic depressive illness, and we compare that to the length of stay those people had for our health plan if they went inpatient. The inpatient length of stay was 8.3 days. So actually the length of stay in crisis stabilization was a full day shorter than our average length of stay would be if those members had gone inpatient, which they would have done if we did have crisis stabilization. Now what does that mean in terms of cost deflection? I think Travis said that uh, crisis stabilization costs about half what inpatient does. What we found in examining our claims experience in, is that uh, actually crisis stabilization costs about 40% of what an inpatient stay costs. So every member that went to crisis rather than inpatient saved us 60% of the inpatient cost, which uh, works out to be in excess of $6,000 per patient. Um, so that is an immediate and powerful value add for every member that we convert to crisis stay who would have gone inpatient. We also saw as we looked at our members longitudinally after they were discharged from, from crisis stay and or from inpatient, um, throughout the remainder of the pilot year in 2016, the group that went to crisis stabilization had 1.03 admissions per member going forward. The control group had 1.24 admissions which is a, about a 20% higher rate of readmission following services for the members who went inpatient. So not only was there an immediate cost offset to the use of crisis stave in place of inpatient, there was a longitudinal effect. Members who were uh, given crisis stabilization services consumed less services throughout the remainder of the pilot year, which I think speaks to the value of your person-centered approach and it certainly speaks to the ability you have to stabilize the member and, and uh, marshal a network of resources around them that enable them to stay uh, stable and out of crisis. Now, it doesn't sound like much, perhaps, 1.24 admissions versus 1.03, but if you take that difference uh, between admits per member and you multiply it times the 623 inpatient admissions we had for those same types of illnesses, it comes out to be worth 105 admissions. Not only was crisis saved significantly less expensive per episode, longitudinally, uh, members who'd been in crisis saved, if we could have converted all of inpatients to crisis saved, we could have saved another 105 admissions. Um, now, I realize, we realize it's not realistic to convert all inpatients to crisis stabilization, but I just wanted to share these numbers with you so you could see how powerful those numbers appeared to us. Very, very significant numbers at the high end of the cost scale, most of our cost expenditures you well understand is at the inpatient level of care. And I wanted to talk very, very briefly as well about the member adoption. Because of the concerns that we had with how a commercial member might adopt the Medicaid population in a Medicaid type facility, we asked the facility to track member satisfaction, which they agreed to do, and they sent us quarterly results. So uh, uh, admission into the Wellness Recovery Center was easy. 
75% of members said, yes, it was. Uh, Wellness Recovery Center staff helped me identify and pursue my recovery goals. 99% of people said that was true. Um, How satisfied are you with the Wellness Recovery Center staff's efforts to involve your family and support systems in your care? 75% were satisfied. How satisfied are you with the Wellness Recovery Center staff's efforts to connect you to ongoing services? 90% satisfied. And finally, how satisfied are you with the overall care you received at the Wellness Recovery Center? 98% were satisfied or very satisfied. So what we found using this very simple patient satisfaction outcome tool was, in fact, our members had very, very good experiences in the crisis stabilization program. And that is another key factor is it led to our decision to expand this pilot outside of Virginia to our other 13 states. And I'm going to turn it over to Mike now, who's going to talk some about that. Thanks, Rick. Um, my name is Michael Triplett. I'm one of the behavioral health interns here at Anthem. Uh, so I'll be taking a look at our program expansion and some of the questions we have going forward. Um, so if you look at Virginia first, Uh, We have 43 CSBs. Out of those 43, about 17 uh, contract for crisis stabilization services uh, in a residential setting. Um, So back in April, we had the crisis recovery meeting, uh, which allowed us a chance to network with our crisis uh, stabilization providers and let them know about our pilot. Um, So as of right now, our pilot, we have three of our CSBs contracted and we're uh, working closely with a few others to get them in our network for the pilot um, because we think, you know, um, you know, the more, the more CSBs we have involved in the pilot, the better. It gives us a larger pool to pull data off of and see if we're really uh, decreasing the readmissions and avoiding hospitalization. Um, so as far as our other Anthem states go, our other 13 states, um, right now Virginia is the first to start this pilot. So they're watching closely uh, to see how we're doing, um, see some of the numbers we pull back from that, um, and to gauge the viability of it in their states. Um, So uh, some differences between uh, crisis stabilization in different states. Uh, Like Rick was saying earlier, most states have CMHCs. I know they're known as CSBs here in Virginia. Uh, Even some places have emergency service programs. Um, Those are all the the same thing, though, just points of entry into publicly funded mental health and substance abuse. Um, So we've we've seen uh, that here in Virginia, uh, some differences with our crisis stabilization units. Um, Most CSBs are connected with one crisis stabilization unit and refer the people in their areas to one crisis stabilization unit. Um, but we have four CSUs in Northern Virginia that serve more as multi-regional CSUs where they take uh, patients from multiple uh, CSBs um, because we have about four CSBs in about a 30 mile radius of each other. So some of those CSUs take, take patients from multiple CSBs. Um, and then, then what you'll see in states is the difference between publicly or locally funded uh, providers of crisis stabilization and private providers. Um, since historically, crisis stabilization hasn't been covered under commercial insurance. Uh, you've seen most of the locally funded uh, public mental health centers uh, cover this. But with the introduction of the RTC benefit, Um, you'll definitely see more privately owned crisis stabilization providers come out. Uh, I know in Virginia we have one, they already have their license for crisis residential, um, and then their website, uh, it says their crisis program is coming soon. Um, And then in states like California, um, they're, they're overrun with privately run crisis stabilization providers. So you'll just have to check state from state. Um, Travis, can you go ahead and move to the next slide? Okay, some of our questions moving forward. Uh, The first point here is 
medical management. As Anne was saying earlier, with our crisis stabilization pilot, there's a blanket authorization of uh, 15 days. In our other Anthem states, um, when they begin pilots, uh, they'll have to see if 15 days is appropriate for their pilots based off of things like quality of service or average length of stay, if they're uh, saving on cost. Um, so they might want to go the route of our regular UM review process, uh, where days are author authorized on a case-to-case -case basis, and a certain amount of days are authorized for each patient. Um, because the objective, obviously, is to see a reduction in readmissions or avoid hospitalization altogether um, so that our members are being treated more effectively. Uh, so from state to state, um, our other Anthem colleagues will have to make the determination if they want to use uh, the 15-day authorization or uh, UM, UM management. Um, as far as detox services go, my next point here, uh, we've seen with a lot of the residential facilities, they also have detox services there, uh, which is understandable. It's a necessity at a facility where you also may have substance abuse programs uh, to have a detox unit there. Um, but as far as our pilot goes specifically, it's for mental health primary diagnosis only. And the primary diagnosis of substance abuse is a rule out for crisis stabilization. Um, so having detox in these facilities, uh, it provides a window in our pilot. It provides a window uh, for a problem because if, if, say, for example, you have a patient that comes in uh, with a primary mental health diagnosis and is in crisis stabilization for a couple days, then you realize he may have a substance abuse problem um, and he begins withdrawing and you need to do detox. Um, we, we don't think that should fall under our pilot because we wouldn't feel comfortable giving that 15-day automatic authorization. Um, so as far as the, the pilot goes, um, the detox, uh, the facilities, if they meet our participating requirements, uh, they can provide detox services, but uh, all of that needs to go under our standard UM review process. And lastly, uh, concerning our child and adolescent members, um, in Virginia, um, our community service boards, none of them we've seen have their programs designed specifically for children. Uh, I know in other Anthem states like Kentucky, uh, their community mental health centers have programs for adults and separate programs for children. Um, so on a state-to-state -state basis, that'll have to be decided whether uh, they see, see the viability in providing services for child and adolescent members. Um, so on the next slide here, Travis, I provided some contact information for Rick and Ann, and uh, I'm going to pass it back to you to uh, keep it moving on. Thank you so much, Michael. That was really helpful. And thank you also to Rick and Ann. Uh, so validating to hear your support for this model of care. Um, and so cool to see that you're taking an initiative at a, at a national level to go out and authorize uh, these uh, ser services in, in the other states that you're located in. Um, I think it's safe to say that uh, in addition to the, the crisis world that uh, many of our providers exist in, uh, we're also sometimes asked to live in, a, uh, in, a, in an irrational world uh, where people make decisions that don't make a lot of sense or they go very much against what we believe as providers. Um, and it's really refreshing and encouraging to see uh, that, that, that your analysis and, and now your efforts are, are to support what feels to, to the providers in our group is the right thing to do which is to uh, support this service, to reach out, to be a part of it, uh, and, and, to, and to make it a part of your, uh, your, your, your benefit plan. So very cool to see, very encouraging. Thank you all so much. It was so helpful to have you here. Um, I would like to now um, introduce our, our other presenter uh, for today, uh, Carrie Zarbach. Carrie leads Optum Behavioral Health Utilization Management in the Northeast region as the regional vice president. 
The Northeast region provides behavioral health utilization management for independent health plans, employer groups, and United Healthcare commercial, Medicaid, and Medicare membership. Carrie has been with Optum for 14 years, providing leadership in utilization management, quality, compliance, and government programs. She has over 30 years of leadership and direct care experience in the mental health and chemical health fields, including managed care settings, community behavioral health organizations, and with families experiencing abuse and neglect. Carrie is an active local community volunteer and an advocate at the national level as a consumer advocate in research and related activities for the National Cancer Institute since her appointment in 2001. Mrs. Zarbach has a master's degree in social work from the University of Iowa and is a licensed independent clinical social worker. Carrie, we welcome you to today's call. If you could push star six to join us on your audio, we're very glad to have you here. Good afternoon. Thank you for that nice introduction and for including me in this presentation. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, so go ahead and go to the next slide, please, Travis, and even on to the next one, is um, just do a little bit of introduction about Optum and talk about our mission and what we do. I think that can be helpful in terms of the context as you're moving from contracting with state and local government organizations into uh, the health plan world. Just want to give you a little bit of context. Where I'm primarily going to focus my time is on sharing information about the uh, Mental Health Crisis Alliance, which is a group that came together with a number of different constituents 15 years ago, looking at um, mobile mental health mobile crisis services, also an urgent care center, and supporting that kind of transition into or out of crisis residential services as well. And then also just we'll talk a bit about building partnerships with health, with health plans and kind of the focus that we bring as we're looking to kind of a system-wide. Go ahead to the next slide, please. So with Optum, our mission is to help people live healthier lives and to make the health system work better for everyone. And so everyone does actually include all of us, um, including those people without insurance. How do we support organizations working outside of the traditional health system, as well as looking at the kind of system-wide services and um, the people that we serve through the different members that we um, are contracted with to support. Next slide, please. So um, those of you who have been working in behavioral health as um, providers within that organization might be more familiar with United Behavioral Health. We're changing our name, have been in process with that for a while. So we're really Opta, which is a health services innovation company. We are part of United Health Group. And you can see both the United Health Group mission as well as the description of Optum services and the volume of members and um, the, the rank of our company as number six in the Fortune 500 company. Next slide, please. So we work with the entire health system, work with providers, four or five hospitals are in our network. We work with employers, health plans, all the different life sciences, governments. I think that also what providers talked about the hospitals, we also of course work with the full continuum of care within the community that we serve and to 115 million consumers that we have those connections with. And we're continually working to how can we improve the health system? How do we help those lives of our members? 115 million people that we serve, how do we empower them? How do we educate them, give them the tools that they need to make the connections to the care that they need at the right time? Next slide, please. Also within Optum, 
we are looking at kind of five major capabilities that we have. Um, pharmacy care services, healthcare delivery, healthcare operations, so really helping the organizations, including nonprofit um, organizations of all sizes, and being able to provide the data and analytics to support those different parts of our organization and the needs within the modern healthcare system. Another area is population health management, and that is the area that our behavioral health solutions um, resides in. So we're really looking at kind of an overall population health management, and then bringing that, how do we really bring that to the individual? So it feels like the individuals are getting the specific care that they need. Next slide, please. So I want to talk more about the successful partnership example. This is the Minnesota Mental Health Crisis Alliance. And on this slide is their um, website, mentalhealthcrisisalliance.org. And most of the information and much more information is on their website. They are prepared to um, receive contact from you um, with more information, more um, the ability really to do those in-depth conversations that you might like to, and maybe even use some of the outcome data that has been collected over time. Next slide, please. So I had kind of not realized that it was 15 years ago that this um, coalition, I would call it, of organizations came together. So that was kind of a fun uh, realization as I was getting ready, putting this information together. So 15 years ago, the Minnesota Attorney General got together, um, coerced, I will say, a number of different organizations to start talking to one another due to a mental health crisis in terms of hospitalization beds. There were too many people that needed mental health inpatient care that couldn't get it so that Minnesota residents were being sent out of state and also out of the Minneapolis-St. Paul metro area in order to get their needs met. We all know that when you can get the care you need in your community, it's so much easier to be able to transition in and out of the different levels of care. And so this group came together as a result of that. So that was the impetus. I will tell you it probably took about six months to build some beginning relationships, start getting those shared values, some shared language through these working groups. And uh, kind of not need the Attorney General to get everybody to the table anymore. So that um, the groups that were involved were the hospital, the state, the counties, the health plans, the different uh, state agencies, also consumer groups. And we worked together um, developed these working groups. We were meeting at least weekly for honestly about three years. And there were multiple groups meeting. Um, as we identified what the right care at the right time was, then we all said, okay, there's some new services we need. How are we gonna do that? All of the local health plans, Minnesota requires health plans to be not for profit. And so there are a limited number of plans in the state all the health plans agreed to make a one-time contribution to a community foundation who then looked at what are the crisis services around the state that are needed and made those awards rather than health plans making those awards. Also, the Minnesota Department of Human Services, so in Minnesota it's called DHS, made a grant, and also the different partners all made contributions to kind of get things started. Next slide, please. So some of the challenges that we had were really to identify the, um, that shared language and also start to share values. About three months into this process, we've been meeting in the morning, we we're coming back and meeting in the afternoon. So we all went out to lunch together. And uh, I overheard one of the county employees who went on to become a good friend. Um, say to somebody, did you ever think you would go to lunch with a health, somebody that worked for a health plan? And uh, so that was kind of the state of affairs 15 years ago. We didn't really talk 
And as I've heard from my colleagues around the country, and as I'm working in the northeast part of the country now, I think some of those barriers still exist. And so I want to be able to kind of just talk through and see if our experience might help you make some of those connections. Also, we needed to start understanding and appreciate the systems that we work in. And what are those similarities and differences? We also came together and um, identified that we did have shared goals and developed that shared vision. We also needed to really overcome some culture of competition between the health plans, between the hospitals, between some of the counties, um, and understand that we all have different financial, legal, systemic constraints that we're living with. I think one of the uh, real challenges we needed to overcome is kind of feeling when um, somebody's been working in a nonprofit world for a long time, it can sometimes feel, and I've been there, um, like, oh, we're the only ones to struggle financially. You look at those health plans, whoever, they've got a big checkbook. They should just be able to pay for this. And so part of what we really needed to do was figure out that we all face financial challenges. None of us has a large pool of money just sitting out there. But how we can braid that funding and deal with those different systemic issues or constraints um, and overcome those together was really something that we were able to do. Next slide, please. So our early name for the organization that we formed was East Metro Adult Crisis Stabilization. So we did not form a nonprofit. This was solely a coalition. We worked with one of the counties who acted as the financial um, organization to gather money and be able to distribute it. We also began comprehensive planning and decided that we needed to actually provide crisis stabilization services, that it was not a service that was billable at initially, but we did work together and were able to add that to the state plan amendment, so the Medicaid covered services. Also, all of the local health plans agreed to pay for this service, not only for their Medicaid population, but also their commercial population. Now, those are the fully insured populations um, at this point, we couldn't offer it to the self-insured large employer groups, but um, kind of started with the fully insured health plan. Then also DHS made some infrastructure grants. Next slide, please. So here's who those um, components, those organizations were from the Mental Health Crisis Alliance. There were the counties, health plans, state agencies, hospitals, and those consumer groups. Next slide, please. So the early model we looked at is EMAX was kind of the central organization. We would do planning. We would accept grant dollars. We would accept partner dollars. We actually hired staff without a structural uh, organization, but through the county who acted as the financial administrator, they actually became uh, county employees and funneled money through that way, and then began developing crisis services and actually providing those. Next slide, please. Then we had to figure out um, and get referrals for this. We know there was a need out there, but how are people going to find out about this? And which population could we serve? And then we need to begin to understand the needs of the people we serve figure out ways to increase insurance coverage because people were coming for this crisis service with no insurance coverage, and then how could they access ongoing care? Um, also figuring out funding has always been an issue that we had to kind of figure out each year. One of the issues that we also identified was a number of people were experiencing this crisis, which was getting exacerbated because they did not have appropriate housing and we needed to help them find some um, appropriate housing. Um, one of the things that was surprising was that um, most of the people served through the, this mobile crisis team had not, were not known to the county or known to any of the mental health providers previously. So we did feel like we were tapping into an unmet need in the community and providing a service that was not um, 
not currently available. Next slide, please. We then had some of our EMACS members travel to Phoenix, Arizona, um, and visit with Recovery Innovations to learn more about their programs and also how to integrate with peer support specialists. So um, Travis opened this, there was that discussion about really looking at a recovery model, resiliency was so key, and that has been a part of the mentality and the approach to care since our early, those first meetings in 2002, which was also one of the the shared values that we um, quickly identify, that we're all focused on the individual, providing what is best for them, helping them find what's best for them, and to engage them toward that recovery resiliency model. That this is not something that is a one-time, well, maybe it can be one-time, but um, in terms of the interaction with the crisis team, but how do we help them on their recovery path? We also identify that we thought a, a physical presence to this point, it was, there were no bricks and motor, mortar. So I decided that we really did need some kind of urgent mental health center or crisis center that would help us be able to provide that more integrated and coordinated system. Ramsey County actually then came forward with a plan. Um, they had some land that wasn't being used. They decided to combine um, detox mental health commitment courts, and a new mental health crisis center in one. And as a part of this unusual partnership, they actually said, Emacs, we want you to be the ones that design this crisis center and design the service that would be provided there. We also had like a subcommittee of the, of the focus on art um, that brought in a lot of consumers and the uh, art that they were producing um, to be displayed within the center, again, to be that welcoming center um, that uh, would integrate peer support and a recovery model. Next slide, please. So in 2009, we figured out we needed to have a new structure. Um, we created some more committees. We did go forward with renaming uh, the group to the Mental Health Crisis Alliance because we wanted to um, expand beyond just adults, although that was continued to be primarily who is served here. There is another uh, group that focuses on children's mental health crisis services that many of the same participants are in both groups. Um, and very exciting, the new Urgent Care for Mental Health um, opened in September of 2001. Certified peers were added to the urgent care team. And while initially foundation grant funding was received, at this point, um, peers are just incorporated into the cost of, of running the crisis center into the entire budget. And so there's not additional funding that supports that. Psychiatry costs still do require additional funding um, to maintain. So we do have psychiatric care um, also um, the ability to prescribe by nurse practitioners so that people come to the crisis center can receive the medications they need as well as um, get the crisis de-escalation, stabilization, and move on from there. Uh, the next slide shows the urgent care center, what it looks like. And then the next slide, and it shows the, the um, models that had been in place from 2009 until actually just recently. So I just learned after I sent the slides in that the Joint Powers Agreement is actually not in place any longer. Um, it was three counties who were engaged and the counties decided they really didn't need to have that anymore. And so it is now back to a coalition that each member um, signs a letter of support and um, it, it's back to that informal group again. So there is the service delivery that occurs through the crisis stabilization, as well as the mental health urgent care center. The urgent care center is, um, the employees are employees of the county. The crisis stabilization teams are employees of nonprofit organizations that the Mental Health Crisis Alliance uh, contracts with also do planning around what are the future needs 
and accept grant dollars. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we also talked about from the beginning is um, some of the outcomes, but also just want to share what we um, decided or what we learned through this whole process. We really needed that shared goal, which has kept this group going for 15 years. Um, that goal is to improve service to consumers throughout the continuum of their needs. That understanding that we all had those constraints allowed us to really work within those constraints, learn from one another, and build partnerships outside of um, this own sole project. Um, that really having those relationships and trust allowed for a lot more coordination um, throughout the, the service delivery system. We also really realized that only one part of the healthcare system can't resolve problems on our own. I think that um, at different times, health plans think, oh, yep, we've got it, or uh, counties do um, kind of think, well, we're the ones that are responsible, and so we've got to fix this. But we really found that coming together, you can resolve so many more problems. And that investing in gathering data and analyzing outcomes is really critical. So I want to share some of the outcomes with you and that actually how these things came together over time. Because if you are, um, maybe you've got a bunch of outcomes, but the reality is it's always challenging to find dollars and resources to really be thinking about those outcomes. So next slide, please. We actually started with just process measures. So how many crisis assessments, how many phone calls, um, started with a consumer survey. So 32% of those receiving crisis assessment would have gone to the emergency room. And this was all based on their viewpoint. And we did feel like um, those people would have then potentially been admitted. 67% said they would have gone to the emergency room also for their medication refills or to get obtain medication, 98% strongly agreed or agreed that they were given the opportunity to participate in their care and that planning, which again was a core value of the group. Next slide, please. In 2004, this is just kind of a snapshot in time, 41% of the population was between 18 and 29 years old. We were surprised by that and um, made us realize we needed to ensure that we had those resources for this population, again, that did not have insurance at that time, but a much younger population than we thought. Again, that these 88% of the clients did not have a mental health targeted case management, so did not have that connection to the county. 64% of client referrals ended up coming from emergency departments after this was in place um, so that we were able to also divert not just from hospitalization but from emergency departments. And anybody that has been to an emergency room knows that those are not the best places for people with mental health, um, in a mental health crisis or an escalation of their symptoms. The emergency room is not the place that you want to be. So to be able to divert those words um, we've seen is very positive. And 30, only 30% 30 of the clients were referred from county services. So 70% um, really were from other sources. Next slide, please. Um, so also the state of Minnesota conducted some evaluation after the first year of service and found that 88% improved their access to community-based services, so they were. Um, and I will also say that the majority of clients during the first year were from the Medicaid population or uninsured, which expanded over time, to, uh, but I'm not gonna quote exactly what it is now, but definitely did it increase over time. And 81% of the people served through the um, Christ, mobile crisis team had no hospitalizations seven months after post-discharge, so we thought that was also good. Which then led, next slide please, to an expansion of the service um, and the infrastructure funding by the Department of Human Services and also help support the uh, mobile crisis services being billable. 
So here was um, were some more of the outcomes. So initially, 50% were from inpatient units. Then it became more 60% uh, of the emergency departments, county crisis units, um, and then also hospital inpatient units. This to me was it, that estimated days saved. As you think about um, how to describe and quantify the value of this service, so in 2008, 50% of the emergency room referrals avoided hospitalization. So the estimate really was about a $2 million saving. Our next slide, please. There are also, um, even in addition to the outcomes that are here from 2013, there is new analysis of data that is available in a full report. You can also get full reports on some of these, if this information on that mentalhealthcrisisalliance.org website. So it may be something helpful to you um, as you're looking to expand services or to be able to quantify the value that can bring. So um, one of the things that we looked at in terms of 2008 to 2010 data, the analysis that was done in 2013 was that um, the total cost of all costs in patient hospitalization decreased by $1.2 million, also a statistically significant decrease. Um, we have also showed mental health hospitalizations decreased and that there was a return on investment of $2.16 for every dollar invested. And uh, also with uh, people that had mental health related services, there was also a return on investment. So it didn't have to be just people who, who were at risk of hospitalization, but it helped with other kind of service delivery as well and another return. So the next slide is kind of what the website will look like when you go to the Mental Health Crisis Alliance and the Urgent Care Center, and here is the website address. So the next slide, please. Actually, you can just go jump two slides. Is really looking at building those partnerships with health plans. And did a nice job kind of looking at specifics around billing and um, what the requirements might be to be able to contract with a commercial plan. Um, so I think those are really good in terms of contracting with different Optum parts of our organization. You can start at that optum.com and um, they, it will help you get to the right place. Definitely you want to get to network management. Also thinking kind of even back behind that, thinking about being able to um, present your services um, to, in, in terms of having that shared goal, really we're all here to serve the member. And what can we do for the member? I think at times as we think about being able to show outcomes and um, kind of think about a health plan from a financial perspective, we can sometimes leave the member behind and we call people that we serve members. Um, but to really look at that individual needs and what can you do and how do you present what you can do for those individual members. You've got an effective service. Um, in the meantime, if you don't have a contract, you can request an individual benefit exception. And so that um, even depending on the plan, if it's a large employer group, there may need to, uh, they're the ones that can make that decision. But bundling that through, um, you can start with network, you can start with uh, uh, clinical operations, area of that phone number on the back of the member's card um, to see if that could be a, a benefit exception and it, as a alternative to inpatient care. Really focus on that clinical. Also just um, embrace that open dialogue, help to build your reputation and help people to understand what the value that you bring. Again, I said the network management um, and really being able to think about those shared goals, those shared values come with some outcomes, even if they're not yours, to be able to share what is um, what those outcomes are that other programs similar to yours have been able to find. And then really be thinking about that whole population so that we've got shared consumers. And again, we are, we're all working toward making the health system work better. And as you then can help build that partnership. And to me, that's the 
the way we want to look at this. We're all in this together. We all live and serve our communities and want to uh, make it work better. Think about what problems can you help us solve and what problems can we help you solve. And together, I really do think we can make that health system work better for everybody. Um, the next slide has my contact information. You're certainly, if you're running into barriers, getting in touch with somebody, um, I'm also happy to answer questions. Um, give me a, please, a little bit of time. My, my email box gets a little overflowing, so please don't insult it if I'm slow to respond. Um, so thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Carrie, thank you so much. That was such a fantastic uh, overview of the work that's been done in your community. Uh, and, and it's really nice to see from the other side kind of what 10 to 15 years of collaboration um, has done. Uh, I, I really liked in your lessons learned uh, that you that your first step was about putting the consumer first in your care. And um, uh, it seems like all of the successful models in our country uh, are, are precipitated on that, whether you're talking about uh, Maricopa County in Arizona or Bayer County in Texas or Minnesota or all these other places that um, when people get together and they sit around the table and they say, let's 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 check our self-interest at the door and let's do what's best for the people we serve uh, that, that it, it always seems to work out. I've never heard of a situation in which it didn't where they said, let's put the needs of the people that we serve first. And they said, well, you know, I wish it would have worked out, but it didn't. Um, it, it just doesn't seem to happen. It seems like when everyone's on the same page, uh, some really great work can be done. So thank you so much for uh, for, for sharing that. So we want to uh, take a couple minutes and open up uh, the um, the time here on our webinar for questions. So if you are joining us by phone, um, make sure to hit uh, star six in order to remove yourself from mute, or you can type your question into the message box via Skype. So we will take uh, just a little bit of time here and open it up for questions that any of our uh, attendees might have. Uh, we had a request for the Anthem team to repeat their email addresses, and um, I can go ahead and, and pull that slide back up um, that has the, the Anthem team email addresses on it. Uh, and we should have that right now, right up there. So I do want to reiterate something that the Anthem team said in one of uh, their slides, is that they are actively pursuing other providers to contract with in the states where they have a presence. So if you um, are in one of these states, uh, we definitely encourage you to be proactive and, and to reach out to them. So I believe that, yep, as Michael mentioned, uh, the providers in California, Colorado, Connecticut, Georgia, Indiana, Kentucky, Maine, Missouri, Nevada, New Hampshire, New York, Ohio, and Wisconsin, um, which is basically like a quarter of the country, uh, that, that they're looking to expand their, their, their uh provider network in, in crisis stabilization programs. So um, it, it, if you've thought about what would it look like to, uh, to be able to get paneled or, or certified in your program, uh, this just seems like a golden opportunity to do it and really encouraging again to see uh, a provider, or excuse me, uh, the, uh, the, the health plans like Anthem and Optum uh, taking the initiative in these collaboratives uh, and, and recognizing the benefit of these services. So. Um, any other questions that people have? Okay, uh, obviously a lot of information uh, for us to take in today, a lot of really strong, solid information. Um, I wanna thank again the teams from uh, both uh, Anthem and Optum, uh, Carrie and Rick and Ann and Michael, thank you so much for spending time with us. Um, a couple last uh, uh, items that I wanna go over. Again, if you're interested in learning more about the Crisis Best Practices Workgroup, please visit crisisresidentialnetwork.com. 
Uh, if you're interested in participating, uh, you can email me at travisa at tvdsolutions.com. And just to note that our best practices toolkit is scheduled for release in early 2018. Uh, so again, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we appreciate the time that you spent with us uh, and uh, we uh, look forward to um, uh, exciting new partnerships between uh, payers and providers uh, of crisis services uh, in, uh, in the time to come. So thanks everyone for attending and uh, have a nice rest of your day.